Welcome to a special pediatric psychopharmacology series of the NEI podcast, hosted by Dr. Jeffrey Strawn. Dr. Strawn is a professor of pediatrics and psychiatry and behavioral neuroscience at University of Cincinnati College of Medicine with expertise on mood and anxiety disorders in children and adolescents. In this series, he will engage with fellow experts to discuss important issues related to psychopharmacological treatments for psychiatric conditions in pediatric patients. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Strawn, and it's my pleasure to interview my good friend and colleague, Dr. John Walkup, who is head of the Pritzker Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health at the Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago and a Margaret C. Osterman Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science. He also serves as Director of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. Walkup and I are going to be talking about a topic which we receive a lot of questions about, and that is deprescribing in child and adolescent psychiatry. Welcome, Dr. Walkup. Hi, Jeff. It's so good to be here. And we are excited to have you. So let's jump in. Tell me about the clinical scenarios where deprescribing should be strongly considered in kids. Well, you know, in the bad old days, we didn't even talk about deprescribing. We just uh, took kids off meds. We transitioned them to another med. We um, did all kinds of stuff, and we never really thought about it as deprescribing. But it's kind of become a a concept, I think, that's more formalized now and, and important. Um, I think when I think about it, um, we take kids off medicine all the time when the kids have side effects or problems with the medicine um, or when the medicine doesn't appear to be working and we need to kind of reconsider the diagnosis and the, and the treatment strategy. So I think those are the very common ones. Um, the, the one I think is the most challenging is when people have been on a medicine they're doing very, very well, and they've really earned the opportunity for a therapeutic discontinuation. And so that's the that's the young person uh, where where I tend to spend a little bit more time thinking about just how to do that and what the consequences of that kind of deep prescribing are. There's also a group I've been in the field a while now, and there's a group of uh, people who, at some point or another, will become pregnant, and many of them. Uh, at least that I've cared for, uh, are on psychotropic medications. And so sometimes there's some pressure um, to do a therapeutic discontinuation before a person uh, puts themselves in position to become pregnant uh, because there's a lot of pressure to discontinue whatever you're on when you become pregnant and or when one becomes pregnant. And so that's another scenario just because I've been in the business a longer period of time now where some of my my younger patients are are getting to that point where they're thinking about getting pregnant and, and think about the impact that their medicine may have on them during pregnancy. Really like how you laid that out, John. So I got that correctly. We have stopping a medication because it's not working. We have therapeutic discontinuation. In other words, the medication has worked. I've crossed the finish line. I got to remission. We have, I ostensibly got to remission and things are going well and I've continued to do well and now maybe I'm thinking about becoming pregnant. Or I guess another thing that I might consider is what about those scenarios where I'm having side effects from the medicine and and maybe now I need to go on to something else? Yeah, those are the kind of typical ones where we, you know, and again, in the bad old days, we used to stop, clear out and then start. Uh, but I think most of us know that even if the medicines are causing some side effects that are troublesome, um, sometimes the patient has experienced benefit during that period of time. And so just washing them out um, and leaving them without kind of coverage for a period of time while that second medicine is kicking in and beginning to work, even though it may have fewer side effects, there's a period of time in there where symptoms may come back and can be quite troublesome for patients. So most people are kind of cross tapering or or kind of overlapping medicines now, and that's got its own kind of special challenges associated with it. Certainly. And I think I'd love to, to hear more of your thoughts around that. I know you and I work a lot in the antidepressant space. Yeah. 
I was wondering if maybe you could spend a couple of minutes talking about how you decide when it's time to stop an antidepressant medication. Yeah, you know, um, you and I see a lot of young people with anxiety disorders and and uh, and a little older group that that um, has experienced depression. But you know, part of uh, what the way I think about it is is I spend a lot of time with patients, getting them started, kind of introducing them because for for me anyway, I see a lot of new new patients with new problems. I do see some more complicated folks over time, but new patients with new problems. You know, you want to get them started off on the right foot, have the right understanding about what the role is in their treatment, and then importantly, take them to remission and then have them really live in remission for enough time that they really can experience what full remission looks like. As you know, many of our patients have been ill for a number of years before we get to to treat them. Even, even new treatment cases have been ill for a while. And so people really don't understand who they are when they're ill. Um, they, they know something's the matter and when they feel better, they, they don't always really appreciate that it was the medicine that did it and that the medicine has a role in keeping them well. And so kind of doing that kind of basic, um, getting started, getting going and good maintenance, um, kind of sets up a, a patient who goes into remission and then setting up a time for a therapeutic discontinuation. I guess it. I also wonder if if you think about discontinuation of antidepressant differently in, say, that patient with an anxiety disorder versus a patient with a mood disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder. Yeah, you know, the um, uh, I do, you know, the kids, this is something that I think we're beginning to talk about now. And, and I, I don't know if there's a lot out there, but Many of the kids that we treat with anxiety disorders are seven, eight, nine, ten, right? Sure. And many of them really do go into remission and really have absolutely spectacular outcomes. Um, that can also happen with OCD. Uh, the certain subtypes of OCD, I think, are more sensitive and responsive. And then there are some teenagers with depression who also have a really good response to these medicines. Um, so the the interesting thing with all three of those disorders is none of them are kind of static over time. So the eight or nine year old who has really substantive separation anxiety and really is struggles to go to school and can, can't even be in a different room in the house with their parents and find their way into their parents' bedroom at night because they're just so fearful of separations. Those kids, if you treat them for a little bit of time, maybe a year or two or you know, sometimes they're reluctant to come off because they remember how difficult it was. So let's say you're out three years. Um, when those kids come off medicine, they don't necessarily go back to the same kind of separation anxiety that they had when they were eight years of age. And clearly patients with mood disorders, um, that first episode depression, if you actually bring it to remission and offer them a really good outcome, sometimes when you discontinue them, the mood disorder that they actually experience um, when, when symptoms come back may have different quality or character to it and may actually have a different level of severity. It's, it's almost as if these disorders have a kind of a life course of their own and the medicines really work and are capable of putting people into remission. But when you take them away, the disorder, the disorder that may come back may be quite different than the one that you initially treated. So kind of looking at patients with that kind of understanding that, that um, you've got a lot of work to do getting them getting them on and getting them to remission. There's a fair amount of work in taking people off. It's it's not something that you just tell people how to taper and say goodbye. I think that's a really interesting point. And I think that's one of the things that's probably very difficult for families and quite frankly for us as clinicians to appreciate the fact that especially as we take patients off medications very slowly, you may have had a patient who's done quite well in terms of treatment for their anxiety disorder. And as you slowly withdraw a medication over the course of three or six or nine months, that patient over time may have developed panic disorder that may have been masked because of their successful treatment with an SSRI. So yeah. now what was generalized anxiety disorder that had been successfully treated 
over time, they developed panic disorder. And now you have generalized anxiety disorder plus panic disorder. And it looks, in fact, like you have withdrawal emergent panic attacks, right? That was just the phone call I had the other day. Um, what did you do? Well, you know, for, for, um, without giving anything away, you, you know, the thing to do is to put them back on and make sure you can make it all go away and put them back into remission again. But there are some people who are just kind of sick and tired of kind of being on medicine and they kind of want to tough it out. They want to see what they're really like. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of that, that value system. Because sometimes these conditions are quite debilitating, particularly in people who have been very high functioning when they've been in recovery. They, they don't quite know what I know about how disabling these conditions will be if, if they really let the condition kind of run its full course. So these are, this is why, you know, when you start treatment you have to forge that relationship. So when you get into these complicated situations with discontinuation, you have enough of a relationship that you can really walk people through the complications that can occur with discontinuation. Um, it's not like you want to go see somebody different to discontinue. You, if I'm starting you, you, you want to finish with me. And so I tell people I, I, I spend time putting you on and I, I'll spend a lot of time taking you off. So you start that discussion in terms of med discontinuation prior to starting the medication. Absolutely. The, the one thing that that parents, once they've crossed that threshold, they've got past side effects and everything they've read in the newspaper and all that sort of stuff. The biggest question is, how long do we have to do this? And so I have a pretty stock response that I use. Um, there's a little bit of data out there, but because we haven't done those trials, like you know, to discontinue, to really know what's the best way to discontinue, um, a lot of it is really just having done discontinuation and learn, learn from kind of mistakes and timing and other kinds of issues. So I do, I, I present that right off the bat at the beginning so that people know, people know what to expect longer term with the medicines. Can, can you walk us through that discussion? Sure. So what I usually do is I look at my watch and I say, you know, any kid who gets started as of today, this is really um, beginning of September, let's say, um, Based on your work, they're going to see they're going to see some benefit just begin to peak through kind of early October. They're going to have in a month or so, they're going to have about 50 percent of improvement uh, with the anxiety disorders. If we do really good psycho farm in a timely way with appropriate dosing, we're going to have about half of the kids into remission by week 12. And and most kids will achieve maximum benefit by week 24. So if we look at six months from today. That's like March. I think I'm counting right, maybe February. And um, and so what I would say to the family is once you kind of reach maximum benefit and you are in remission, then I count a year from there. And so uh, first time I would talk with you about discontinuation would be a year from next February if you started today. And um, I'd try and take you down in February and March. And families will say, well, why February and March? And I say, well, what I like about this, the late winter and early spring is the teachers know the young person, the family knows the young person, the youngster is doing well in school or at least stably in school. The after school activities are all stable. So if symptoms begin to gurgle up, um, everyone will be able to kind of notice. I used to discontinue kids in the summer and found that, you know, they were at camp for two weeks and that was the worst time for them to have symptom return. Um, I also used to do it during the winter holidays from Thanksgiving to, to, um, New Year's and, and ruined so many families, um, holiday celebrations. Plus there's so much stress going on in the families that they're yelling and screaming at each other and they begin to call those withdrawal symptoms or return of symptoms. So you don't have a very stable baseline during that holiday period. Whereas February, March, um, kids are kind of in their stride. And so it's a little easier to kind of rule out um, chaos and other kind of stuff that that um, that may happen. Also, if I in February and March, if the kid does have symptoms, I can kind of restabilize them or recapture them so they can go away to camp in the summer and be ready for school in the fall. So again, there's no data to support any of this, but just having done this over time, 
um, it, it's a, it's a sweet spot for me. Plus I learned a long time ago that, um, many schools don't do much in February, March or April. Um, they do a lot of field trips and stuff. So, um, the academics aren't quite so precious at that time of the year. I, I really like that approach and it parallels a lot of what I do. One thing that I tend to do in addition is, uh, which I think is sometimes reassuring for the families is to say, but we'll be flexible with this. Yes. Because I, I like to say, we'll do the nine month thing, but if nine months coincides with the ACT or if nine months coincides with your first AP exam, we can be flexible with that. So, yeah. And, you know, I, I have some families, um, they, they call, you know, August 1st and saying he's going to college on, on August 21st. And I want to take him off meds because I know he's not going to, he's not going to take him once he goes to college. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, he's got to be on him his freshman year. And, uh, the next time I'm thinking about discontinuum, actually, it's going to be spring of his sophomore year because, uh, I want him to finish that freshman year. You and I see all kinds of young people who, um, aren't in their best shape when they head off to college and have to come home in October and November. They don't, oh, they don't make it back to college after the winter break. Um, so I really want my patients to finish that freshman year with and do really, really well. And then, and then once they're in their stride in their sophomore year, I'll take them off again. And families just, once they hear that and they use that logic that, that I, I share with them, they're kind of okay with it. Um, uh, but it is, it is a logic that, that you do kind of have to explain or, or kind of have in your, in your repertoire of discussion. So what I'm really hearing is there's a lot of socializing the parents, the patient, the family to the process of deprescribing, as well as the monitoring, the timing, and just the general approach here. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I've kind of, uh, gotten interested in, in this, um, guy named Boyce who's written about gene environment interaction and how much patients really interact with their disorders. And, um, I'm thinking about some patients, uh, who have been in extended psychotherapies and have a whole psychological explanation for why they're, why they're suffering and why they're really struggling. And some of what, what I do at the beginning with, with those folks is, is to kind of help them create a new narrative about the biology of their condition and the role of medicine in their condition. Because many of these folks come with, you know, I was told it was this about my family and this about my circumstances and this about my capacity to become intimate. And it, yeah, it makes sense to me, but it just doesn't quite fit. And I say, well, the reason it doesn't fit is because they really haven't incorporated the kind of biological uh, etiology to, to your condition and, and how really it's not really your fault and it's not something about your dynamic. It's really about, it's really about your biology. And what we're going to do is we're going to work on your biology and I'm going to help you reformulate yourself a little bit. doesn't mean you don't have issues. It just means that this problem has really got a different set of issues associated with it that are much more in the physical realm and that medicine has a real answer for it. So I guess in that vein, I, I wonder what role does the non-pharmacologic intervention play as we're thinking about the deprescribing of these medications in, in kids, particularly those with anxiety disorders? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, um, it, it is kind of tough when you're, when you're doing, uh, joint care like that with someone who really isn't necessarily sophisticated on the psycho farm because everybody has a dynamic. Um, everybody's got life issues. Everybody's got something going on one way or another. And so I think it's hard sometimes, uh, particularly when some initial symptoms return to not see them as attributable to life circumstances, for example, and to really be tuned into the fact that they may be a kind of a biological expression of too little medicine on board. And that, that, that's a, that's a tough discussion. And, and so this is where I'm saying I, this is where I earn my keep. Um, because I'm, I'm in it with people at that time. It's not like call me if you need me. Um, I'm, I'm really kind of always offering up the hypothesis that this may be more than 
a, a simple dynamic or a tiredness or, you know, you're overworked and underpaid. Um, may, maybe there's something else going on here and, and let me, let me lay it out for you. This is particularly difficult when, when symptoms that come back are not the symptoms that went away. And so, um, you know, that's, that's the piece where I've never had this before. It must be my life experience because it's not like what it was before when I went on the medicine. And that, those can sometimes be difficult discussions. That's, I think, a really important point you're making there. I guess, you know, one of the things that I think about as well is if we go back to, to some of the really nice benzodiazepine studies that were done in the early 90s in adults, where they looked at the cognitive factors that influenced how people were able to stop the benzodiazepines. Certainly, we don't have anything like that in the, in the pediatric literature, uh, but where people essentially looked at their beliefs that they would not be able to function without the medicine uh, or their attribution that all of their improvement was related to the medication. Uh, and you and I you know, yeah. certainly have seen these patients where they attribute all of their improvement to the medication. Uh, and uh, they, you know, in many cases, imagine that they will completely decompensate in the absence of having this medication or be unable to tolerate any distress without the medication. Um, I guess I, I wonder how you how you work with that type of distortion, if if I may. Yeah. You know, the, thankfully, those patients are um, much less common than the ones that get me off this stuff as fast as I possibly can. Um, yeah, I think I think those are those are patients where the kind of hand holding you do up front and and the psycho ed that you do along the way, and you know the knock on the door. Uh, excuse me, but you know we got to start thinking in um, December about having our discussion in February about starting the discontinuation in March, and so just bringing it up and kind of walking them through, and and um, and really encouraging them to take the chance and demonstrate that you're going to be there if if stuff comes back and that you can recapture. I think that's the, you know, I think sometimes you can't recapture. Mm -hmm. um, but but if you don't let the young person kind of get to a point where they're really in a lot of trouble, where you're having to do some substantive work to recapture, if you're really looking at milder symptoms um, and you have some sense that they really are driven by the underlying disorder, then people don't slump quite so hard. And then they go on for another year and then you try it again the following fall. And for those patients, I sometimes go up on the dose a little bit as opposed to you know, do two thirds of the, the last dose. Cause what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, in my own way, over treat, um, to make sure that there was no residual symptoms and that they went into not just the 85 or 88% remission, but a 99.9% .9 remission, because I really want that next year to be successful. And I really want them to, to kind of go into complete remission. Patients are oftentimes satisfied with having 20% residual symptoms. And um, I, I look at people and I say, do you want to be 99% or you want to be 85%? And nobody wants to be 85%. And I'm saying, well, why should we treat you to 85% when we have the capacity with appropriate dosing? You've already experienced the risk of the med. Why underdose yourself? It's, it, it's a cruel fate. You have the stigma of being on the med and you have the stigma of not really having full recovery. So let's go up a little bit and make sure that we can get you to full recovery. And again, those are the kinds of mantras that I use. And, and I think people kind of find those things to be somewhat reassuring and compelling when making decisions about kind of how to treat themselves. I love how you really make the case for setting yourself up for success. Yeah. I guess I really wanted to, to get into some of the specifics here. In terms of thinking about how we actually deprescribe, and I'm going to focus on the antidepressants here, does yeah. the specific antidepressant affect your strategy? And, and for me, I think about you know yeah. some of the early work by Graham Emsley's group where he largely looked at fluoxetine uh, versus some of the more recent studies with escitalopram and uh, certainly uh, work in CAMs and CAMELs with sertraline. Um, do those specific antidepressants inform your strategy with a patient in terms of how to taper? 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, there's the there's the the old saw that fluoxetine self tapers because it's got such a long half life and such a long half life active metabolite, and and you you can kind of not goof that up. And um, there was the 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 similar old saw that if you know if you used a shorter acting drug and and they began to have withdrawal symptoms, a, a quick transition over to fluoxetine will give them a kind of a longer, slower tail. Right. right. Um, there's stuff like that that's kind of out there. Um, I don't, I don't know if there's any data, but I, I do think when I start counting, it's one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of fluoxetine is it, it puts me in kind of, um, handcuffs. It has a lot of approvals and stuff, but because of its ultra long half-life, it's nonlinear pharmacokinetics and it's drug, drug interaction profile. It's, it's not a great drug for young kids. And, um, and people say, well, yeah, but what about the teenager who's going to miss a dose? And I said, I, I understand that, but I'm really working hard for my patients not to miss a dose. Um, I'm not, I'm not planning for poor adherence, even though it is a, a part and parcel. I, I really work for full adherence. And I think the strategy of doing the education and the for, foretelling the future and talking about when discontinuation has can happen. I think that kind of leads people to, to be a little bit more adherent. But anyway. Um, so fluoxetine self tapers, I think we've also talked about paroxetine, which I don't think many people use anymore and, and it's fall off the cliff, um, kind of change in, in metabolism over time. And, and, um, and I, I'm, I'm much more because again, I treat younger kids. I use much more sertraline and, and, uh, fluvoxamine, not so much, but sh the shorter acting drugs, um, Citalopram and escitalopram are kind of the Goldilocks. They're not too short. They're not too long. Um, they, they, uh, I worry a little bit more about weight gain with them and, and some kind of, kind of dulling or something that, that patients will describe. It's maybe a little heavier feeling like Paxil used to provide to people that kind of a deeper calm as opposed to an energizing effect, but, um, subtle, subtle differences in drugs. So. When I think about those drugs, there's the acute wash where, you know, the, the drug is really out of the system over time. And I also try, as I've ramped people up, try to figure out what the dose was that kind of put them into remission and then do a little bit more to make sure that I have a stable remission. And so when I drop down, I drop down to that dose that got them better. And then the next dose decrease is really going to be that one that will will allow for return of symptoms without the floor kind of falling out from underneath them. So there's things like that that I think about with the shorter acting drugs where, where I can actually kind of envision what's happening biologically. Whereas with fluoxetine, it's, it can stay in the body for a really long time and it's very hard to predict when you're going to hit that place. Uh, I know a lot of people like it and use it and use it successfully. But for me, when I'm, when I'm trying to do my, my, uh, my shtick with folks, I, I kind of like to know what's happening in the body and it should be cleared by now. And so then what we're really waiting for is the biology to kind of bounce back to its pathologic sh uh, shape. And that process, I think we've come to understand from, from the available withdrawal studies happens over a six to 12 week period. And so that monitoring process, once they get below that dose, I'm looking for symptoms and um and being extremely careful with people um during that six to twelve weeks and then you know if i can get past 12 weeks at at no dose or ultra low dose i feel pretty good about putting them into longer term maintenance then and and knowing that we've had a, a discussion we've had a procedure we've worked with each other and that you're going to call me if stuff comes back and then i do a year follow-up or a follow-up around those precious times so for kids, it would be the start of school, maybe the winter break, uh, spring break, start of summer vacation. So even after they're off, I'm going to look and see when symptoms were some, were somewhat difficult for them given when they were ill and think about doing follow ups during that period of time when, when I know that symptoms might begin to pop back up again because of, of life events. So, John, it sounds like you're really thinking about that complex interplay between the pharmacodynamics and the pharmacokinetics of a given drug, but you're also thinking in terms of 
how that individual patient responded at a given dose, as well as the target symptoms and how those responded, as well as the dynamic factors related to particular time points for that child's life. This is a lot of stuff. Is this what I'm doing? Yeah, it sounds like it. Well, you this know, is master clinician level, John. You know, it's very intuitive for me, and I've been fortunate to kind of practice like I want. And um, you know, not every not every practitioner has been able to do that. And and I've worked with patients who have taught me so much about this process, about what they need, what they need to know, and what they need to understand. Um, and and so I've been very fortunate to to be able to be in that kind of a reflective practice with with uh, great patients who have taught me a lot. But but probably the most interesting thing for me is I've been able to put people into remission. And I think there's many clinicians, and I I worry a little bit about our trainees today. Um, in a two year uh, child psychiatry fellowship, they don't get to put too many people into remission. And so some of our fellows were. We're just talking with some recent graduates about what their experience has been like after they graduate. They're working really, really hard and they're putting people into remission because they're what we told them to do, but they never got a chance to see what that was like during, during, uh, during training, just because of the, the time frame of training and, and the kinds of exposures they get. So it, it's good to hear that we, we shape their minds, um, so that when they go out there, they can, they can kind of learn on the job about this stuff and, and really begin to, to get an understanding of what they need to do in order to get people better and keep them better. I think you're absolutely right. Another question that I had uh, that relates to our, our current discussion is in terms of thinking about that patient who you've discontinued or perhaps are discontinuing the medication. One of the things we haven't talked about is withdrawal symptoms. Mm -hmm. and I know those probably vary from medication to medication. So I guess focusing on the antidepressant medications, can you tell us a little bit about the withdrawal symptoms that you tend to see? You know, um, I, uh, there's a few patients in my memory who were kind of, um, I, I think this is okay to say hell bent on getting themselves off. And so, didn't really want to be followed during that period of time. They wanted to do their own thing. And they would, they told me that they would pay whatever price it took because they just wanted to get off. And those, those patients had all kinds of unusual symptoms. And I think that they bear no real, um, similarity, at least in my hands anyway, to kind of the characteristic pattern of disorders that I look for to treat as well as I expect to see when people discontinue. So, um, and thankfully, um, again, I've, I've had a, a kind of a rich and, and rewarding practice. I haven't seen many people who really have gone through pretty substantive withdrawal. The, the thing that's out there and others may know about more, but is being increasingly talked about is this kind of tardy nature of some adverse withdrawal effects. And um, I really don't quite know how to understand that because there are some people who, who have reported that they uh, were on medicine and they came off, they had withdrawal effects and those what withdrawal effects, effects are just never going away. And um, that's not my experience with those who have had withdrawal effects. You can give a small dose and make those withdrawal effects go away and then slow your taper and do it more progressively over time. I think that's, that's kind of common and, and solid practice. But there are some people now, mostly patients and, and patient support group uh, type folks who are really talking about this tardive phenomena. And I, I just think we, we don't understand it very well. So thinking about side effects, we end up with a fair number of physical symptoms as we stop many of the antidepressants, particularly the SSRIs. Uh, we tend to have a lot of flu-like symptoms, mm -hmm. malaise, uh, GI symptoms, myalgias, but we can also see the anxiety, the agitation, irritability, insomnia. Now, certainly, John, these look a lot like symptoms of anxiety. They look a lot like symptoms of depression. I guess one of the issues for me is that these are really tough to distinguish from symptoms of the underlying disorder that I was starting 
the antidepressant for originally. How do you distinguish? And I guess, how do you manage these symptoms? Yeah. You know, I, again, I, I, I tend to, you know, there are people who have broad spectrum disorders and then there are people like me who kind of think about them as pretty, um, pathodemonic, if you will, you know, very circumscribed, well-defined. And, and I tend to kind of hold that picture up against these symptoms. And if I don't know, I don't know. Uh, but I really am looking for the, those characteristic symptoms that they had before or are characteristics of a, a disorder that I know, um, can evolve that the original disorder can evolve into. I think I said that right. So I feel, I feel pretty comfortable with that kind of diagnostic frame and, and also feel pretty comfortable if somebody has something to, um, that is a little unusual or different to feel comfortable calling it a, um, a withdrawal effect, encouraging people to take a smidge of medicine to see if they can make it go away and then slow the taper a little bit, um, in response to that. If it, if it really does look like it, it's a withdrawal effect. I'm not afraid. To put people back up on their dose again. Um, that's part of the explanation is we, we really want to learn what this is and going down and going up and going down and going up while, while it is kind of a, a pain. Um, it's really, really important long term when, when I'm out of business, you're, you're going to want to find somebody like me to carry you through this next episode of illness. And so knowing your illness, knowing what it's like to be on meds, knowing what it's like to come off meds, knowing what symptom comes back first, um, knowing how it impacts you and your own psychology, you know, that's going to be very helpful to the next clinician who works with you. And so, so going through that with people, um, and, and being open to hearing from them and, and maybe even saying like, I just don't know if this is a withdrawal effect or, you know, this is a bad Tuesday. Um, <laughs> just, just don't know, but let's, let's kind of hang in here together and just keep the discussion going. We talk, we talk about, we do this when we start patients, right? Um, that, that we're hanging up and we're responding to them. Um, we walk them through all kinds of stuff that happens in their lives that's got nothing to do with the med. Absolutely. And so, so I, I think it's a very similar kind of, of process. So it sounds like you're really doing three things if I'm following you. One is a fair amount of psychoeducation in terms of let's be curious about this. Let's try to figure out how this looks relative to other things that have happened. Number two, you're almost using the medication as a diagnostic tool in terms of reintroducing that to see if the symptoms get better. Number three, you're, you're really trying to identify a symptom that has some specificity. In other yeah. words, something like maybe a, a dysesthesia, right? So an electric zap or something that isn't consistent with the anxiety disorder, but maybe is somewhat unique, say, for example, to venlafaxine withdrawal or some other type of antidepressant withdrawal, as opposed to something that's not specific, like irritability. Yeah. Um, and and that's that's been a recent one, is irritability. Um and, it, it's and the it's fever just, of psychiatry, right? It's everywhere. It's it's antidepressant withdrawal. It's generalized anxiety disorder. It's depression. It's mania. It's ADHD, DMDD. Yeah, we there's a there's a work group there's a work group on irritability, and I just said you got to you got to do some defining here about the differences in, ir in irritability among the different uh, among the different conditions. But you know, irritability was one. Um, a recent one that I've, that I've, I've heard about and, and it was attributed to over being overworked. And I wasn't so sure. I wasn't so sure that the return of, of irritability was about being overworked because the, looking at yourself, uh, being a hard worker and a nose to the grindstone person, which I, I know, um, uh, it, this this may not be about being overworked. This may be about about that thing coming back, and it's just coming back in a way that neither you or I remember. So let let's uh, let's keep an eye on that one. So John, when we're talking about deprescribing, one of the things that we often don't think about is the fact that we're certainly deprescribers as clinicians, but our patients are also deprescribers. <laughs> our patients stop their medicines all the time. Our 
patients' parents deprescribe all the time. And one of the reasons why our patients and their parents deprescribe is because of fears about medications or potentially side effects. And I'm curious how you handle that, particularly when the patient comes to your office and the family has deprescribed. What do you do? Uh, uh, well, first of all, if you, if you want them to come back for the re-prescribing that may have to occur, you got to be pretty nice about it. Um, I, I really talk about uh, poor adherence as inevitable. It's more of a management issue than it is uh, something to bemoan. And uh, making people feel guilty or terrible about it, um, not, not, not a great strategy. So, um, yeah, you know, and, and every once in a while people deprescribe and they get through it and they're doing okay and they're in a good place. And, and for those families, I just say hallelujah. Uh, um, um, but you're willing to indulge me and let me see in three times over the next year around those crisis points that, that were troublesome for you in the past. Um, congratulations. You're, you're in a, in a good group. Um, but these are, for some people, lifelong conditions and, and you, they may come back at a different time and may surprise you when they do come back. So let, let's, let's do the right thing and, and kind of hang in there with you. You, 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 uh, you did something. I wasn't all that excited about it, but, um, let's celebrate. What about those situations where maybe it was a side effect? Uh, and perhaps there was a, a miscommunication in terms of I've certainly been in the situation where I didn't think the side effect was as significant as the patient or the family thought that it was. Uh, and there's, you know, let's just say some deep prescribing has happened. Yeah. I mean, the one the one that is the most predictable for me are kind of kids, adolescents and young adults who deep prescribe because of sexual dysfunction. Uh, and uh, they're not going to tell you. They're embarrassed to talk about the side effect, let alone the fact that they deprescribed. Um, you know, oftentimes they just say, I don't want to take it anymore. And you say, well, why? And they just say, I don't want to take it anymore. And you say, why? And then you, it dawns on me that, that maybe this is about sexual side effects. Um, those are so tough because kind of sexual functioning has so much to do with who you are as a person how much anxiety you have, how much depression you have, other kind of chemicals that you may take at various points in time. And, um, but I am quite aware of, um, particularly in teenagers who masturbate, that they may have a very different experience masturbating, even though they're not sexually active with another person, that they, they have their own, they have their own sexual behavior and, um, these medicines can impact what it feels like and be kind of very frightening and very scary. And they won't necessarily kind of alert you to that. You know, it's, a, it's tricky. It's tricky because you want people to start medicine. So you have to kind of give them a pretty full review of, of side effects and stuff. Um, and so for those folks where you know are, they're going to have either sex with somebody else or sex with themselves, you, you probably have to talk about sexual side effects. There are some strategies to mitigate some of those now, and um, and there are approaches that can be used. So I try to be reassuring about you know if this can happen, but but let's get you better first, and then figure out whether it does happen, and then if it does, let's let's figure out how to mitigate your sexual functioning issues if the if the medicines are causing. I think that's so important, acknowledging the issue, but also really focusing on recovery and, and just the general patient centeredness of, of your approach. Well, I think, I think some people say, well, I was never good at sex anyway. And when I was anxious, it was really bad. And, and now that I'm on medicine, I'm not anxious anymore. So I have, you know, relationships with people, but you know, it's just a little more difficult to have orgasms now. And, um, and I'd love to think about it with you. That, that's a wonderful conversation to, to have with somebody. That sounds pretty collaborative, quite frankly. Yeah, it is. It is. So just thinking about uh, the deprescribing process, again, big tent deprescribing approach here. Any final thoughts? Um, you know, I'm so glad. Well, so I have a couple of thoughts. 
Um, and some of this is geopolitical. Um, uh, I've read some papers recently about how primary care docs in, in Europe are very determined to take people off medicine when they don't really understand exactly why they were put on medicine. And um, oh, I think we should go here. I really do. Oh, man. And so I've, I've had the opportunity to be, um, responsive and to interact with some of those folks. And they, they don't do the deprescribing like we talk about, like it has risks associated with it. And it's really about much more of an agenda that uh, either the disorders aren't meaningful or the medicines don't work. And both are not true, at least in my opinion. The disorders are quite serious. The medicines can be um, quite meaningfully effective, i.e. they can put people into remission. And if you see somebody who's got no symptoms and is on a medicine, it's not because they don't need the medicine. It's because it could be because the medicine has worked brilliantly. And and if you're going to take them off, then you've got to do the kind of conscientious approach that we've talked about here. And that's not what I'm seeing. It's it's more of a public health strategy to eliminate the use of antidepressants in populations. Usually it's the elderly now who may have some medical complications or whatever, but but we're seeing a big drive by primary care docs in Europe to to discontinue at all odds. We also hear about special populations like foster kids who get a lot of medication and rightly or wrongly and efforts to deprescribe for a large population of kids, um, where sometimes the medicine can be useful in, in maintaining foster home placements or, or school or even residential placement. And not that you should use medicines to kind of keep a school, um, thing going, but, but I do worry that we have, um, forces that really don't appreciate that taking people off medicine is, is as big a deal as putting them on. And that public health strategies that, um, without really thoughtful clinical care, um, that just forces or pushes for discontinuation is not such a great thing. I think that's really such an important point. We often think about the risks associated with medicine, but we don't necessarily think about the risks of not being on medicine or not being in treatment. And we also uniquely don't think about the risks of stopping medication. The risk of suicide significantly increases as one stops lithium. The yep. risk of suicide significantly increases in some populations of patients with depression when you stop an antidepressant. And I think that's something that we rarely talk about. And, and, Again, I think what most people say is when you want to quit, just cut it down by half or cut it down by another half or cut it down and, you know, let me know how it goes. Call me if there's a problem. And I just can't do that with kids. Can't really do that with kids. Wouldn't, wouldn't do that with adults. I think maybe one final point as we're free associating here at the end yeah. is that, you know, when you look at some of these recent studies that, that have been done, including some of the European studies, I think they remind us that we really should consider the pharmacology and particularly the pharmacokinetics of these medications. One of the things that just I find incredibly frustrating is when we look at, for example, the Antler study uh, that looked at uh, antidepressant deprescribing or discontinuation strategies, is that for some of these medications, they went to every other day dosing during the discontinuation which actually makes no sense, number one, from a pharmacokinetic standpoint, but number two, actually puts patients at greater risk of antidepressant withdrawal symptoms, which we know is actually an independent risk factor for suicide attempts. So again, I think one of the things that we unfortunately didn't have sufficient time to talk about on this podcast is how the kinetics potentially inform antidepressant withdrawal symptoms. Yeah. I mean, you know, fluoxetine, you can discon, you can do every other day if you want. You can do it once right. a week just to dose it. I mean, because of its long half life, but our other meds are just not like that. Absolutely um, you not. Got a little of that with citalopram and escitalopram. They're a little longer acting. And so you have a little bit of flex there, but, but not uh, every other day. Not every other day. 
Well, John, it's it's really been a pleasure having you. And I've every time I'm with you, I just learn something new. I really, oh. really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're so kind, Jeff. You're so kind. This is this is so much fun because again, this is the stuff we never get to write about. It's it's only it's only available in podcast form. So uh, stay tuned, folks. Thanks. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the NEI podcast. Please let us know what you'd like to hear more about by leaving a review. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today. For more information about NEI and our premier educational content, please visit neiglobal.com.